In the fall of 2013, I walked into my kitchen and saw a blood dragon burst out of my chest, crash through the wall, and fly off into the horizon. This was not a daydream. It was a full-on, vivid hallucination. My brother Seth and I had just published our second game and were working on an endless runner for mobile, something we had designed to pay the bills and not really much else. The blood dragon began to visit more often the further we moved into dev. First, it would show up once a week or so, a reality break I came to expect when moving between rooms. And then it picked up the pace. Like clockwork, every day the dragon would intrude on my daily routine. It got so curious that I mentioned it to Seth, my brother, co-founder, and game dev partner. We chalked it up to postpartum depression from our previous game release and soldiered on. My energy started to decline. I began waking up later and later and requiring more and more coffee to sustain my work. The dragon came to visit more often still, and the vision of its blood-soaked wings became a common thing that I eventually learned to simply ignore. I figured I was struck with a strange virus, something I had picked up while hiking out east. I decided to start going to the gym more and eating healthier to combat the growing sense of fatigue that was starting to overtake me. My left pec began to swell up, as well as my left lat, which I attributed just to my increasingly intense gym regiments. The dragon started showing up nearly every time I walked into a room. And then the fever came. Hot, boiling temperatures consumed me beginning at 5.30 p.m. each day and put me to an exhausted sleep by 7. I'd wake up at 3 a.m. covered in a bucket of my own sweat. I visited a doctor who sent me home with headache medicine. My generally cheerful disposition hadn't been impacted by being sick all the time, and it made the doctors think that I was doing just fine. I was 23, after all. I called to get a second opinion and was told that I would have to wait four weeks to get an appointment with the doctor. And something about the mention of time caused a sudden panic in me. I told the nurse on the phone that I absolutely could not wait and that I needed to see someone, even if it wasn't a doctor. She lined me up with one of the doctor's assistants for the very next day, and I drove in, took my shirt off as directed, and watched as fear flashed through her eyes and then was smothered by a professional demeanor. She practically ran out of the room and came back with a doctor who I told wasn't going to be available for four weeks. The doctor came in and squeezed the now sizable lump on the left side of my chest. He felt my left pec pushing hard under my clavicle. All these places where I thought my extra gym time had just been doing a hell of a lot of good for me. And then he stepped back from the table and he told me I had cancer. The next few weeks was a flurry of tests, scans, and biopsies. When you get diagnosed with cancer, the first step the doctors take is nailing down just which one you have, because some, I've been told, are better than others. Each time a test came back for me, though, my results were worse. First it was lymphoma, then a rare form of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is more difficult to treat. And then I was staged at 4B. That's shorthand for saying that the doctors genuinely did not know how it was that I was up and walking around. The stage beyond four is supposed to be death. They guessed that I would have died if I waited four weeks for that appointment. And I learned just several months ago that my projected survival rate at the time clocked in at 7%. It turns out that dragon I'd been seeing wasn't some weird mental slip. It really was in me growing more dangerous with each day that passed. My name is Sam Koster. I'm co-founder of Butterscotch Shenanigans, and today... I'm going to talk to you about life, death, and game development. I told myself in preparing this talk that I would leave nothing on the stage today, so if I get a little choked up, please bear with me. Once the tests were completed, the doctors chose a regimen of chemotherapy for me, and I was sent off to the clinic to get all sorts of poisons. For those of you who have not had the uh, good grace to go through chemotherapy, let me try to put it into easy words what it feels like. How many of you have been hung over before? How many of you have been, like, really hung over before? All right. It basically feels like that, just, just worse, and also it lasts a lot longer. Some of the other procedures that you get done are a little less easy to quantify, like getting a bone marrow biopsy, of which I've had the good grace to get seven. It feels like someone punches a dime-sized hole in your backside and then pulls one of your legs out through it. Just for a second. 
The worst part of the whole thing, though, really, is the underlying sense that maybe you're doomed. That's really the hard part that sets diseases like cancer apart from most other illnesses. It forces you, in no uncertain terms, to confront and walk with death. But it turns out that recognizing that you're going to die has a couple benefits, too. The day after my first chemotherapy session, Seth and I sat down at the whiteboard for the first time in basically a month. A whole lot had changed, and yet, here we were, looking at the design and production plan of that silly endless runner we'd been building before I got diagnosed. The whole day passed without the intrusion of the blood dragon, and my energy was actually soaring despite the chemo, largely due to an enormous dose of steroids and a whole lot of tumor death. When Seth left for the day, I cracked open Game Maker Studio, our engine of choice, and began prototyping. I needed to make something to get my mind off the sense of doom that was trying to break in, so naturally I prototyped what was basically a Roomba picking up leaves. <laughs> Once it picks up ten leaves, they turn into sandals. It's incredible. <laughs> the thing is, this was not compelling in the slightest. And this is, this, we remade this recently. This is basically what it looks like. The next morning when Seth arrived, eager to work on the plans we had laid down the day before, I showed him my Roomba. I told him about this crazy world we could build, something that was, it was huge, it was going to have crafting and tons of stories and characters and items to interact with. It was going to be something ridiculous to get us through treatment, something so ambitious that we'd keep ourselves alive just to do it. He asked me why I wanted to build it, and the words fell out of my mouth before I realized what I was saying. No offense to those of you who make Endless Runners in here, but this Endless Runner is not the last game I want to make before I die. I wanted to make something that mattered, not just for money. Seth signed up on the spot. We were going to build this enormous game in an enormous world, and it was going to be a mix of Diablo, Terraria, and Pokemon, and it would be funny, because that's what we needed. But of course, we had no idea how the fuck to do that. Our previous games were making 1500 bucks a month, which was enough to keep me alive by Midwestern standards. But Seth actually hadn't been paid yet. We launched two games up to this point, each of which only took 48 work days to complete, from inception to market. Neither were known very well, and nor were they known for their worlds, their stories, or for making much money. This was reckless by every standard. It was not a business decision. It was an answer to the question that we, living in a relatively safe and affluent society, scarcely have to ask ourselves. What would I do if I were going to be dead in a year? What plans for the future might you have because you assume that you'll be around to enact them? There's a good number of people in this room. And what if I told you that it's not statistically unlikely that someone's not coming back here next year, not because they didn't buy a ticket? How would it change your plans and your behavior now when would you build whatever it is that you're building? For myself and my family, the question of what to do with life became clear. We do the big things we really wanted to do because the worst thing that could happen already did, and we didn't even think about that happening in the first place. Getting sick and being given a rough expiration date suddenly suddenly made me ask a bunch of design questions about my life. Things I never considered before, like, do I really want to do this? Does this make me fulfilled? Is this worth my scarce time? It made me approach my days as if I were actually a game designer, trying to craft the best experience for myself. Why I had never done this before became a mystery to me because my sense of fulfillment soared despite being critically ill. I remember giggling nervously when my mother, who does health and wellness for corporations, walked me through this four-quadrant model. There are things in life that are urgent, non-urgent, important, and unimportant. Everything you can do fits into this box of categories. Yeah, there's a cat in the wood chipper. Be careful. The problem for most people is that they neglect the important but non-urgent things until they slip into the urgent category. Things like hanging out with your family, spending time with your loved ones, working on your game. Most people, in fact, don't run their lives, but rather are run by their lives. So it seemed a little crazy, but I managed to pare down nearly all of my activities to the things that were just important. Cancer gave me a whole lot of clarity. We even developed a phrase for it, which was pulling the C card. When someone tried to pressure me into a situation that wasn't actually important according to my own distinction, I could always fall back on the fact that I was dying and they would have to leave me alone. (laughs) My family and I got down the schedule of going to the hospital every 21 days for that routine poisoning, and I always brought my laptop along. 
Now, while I do all the art for our studio, I do not consider myself an artist by trade. I'm not the sort of person who's been scribbling on every surface available since they were three. In fact, I just started doing art four years ago when we started the studio because my brother Seth is better at programming than I am. Much to the horror of nearly every game artist I've met, I use a mouse to do all of my art. The one fringe benefit of this is that it makes it incredibly easy to continue working from pretty much anywhere. You can work from a bed, you can work from a hospital chair, you can work while getting poisoned. It's fantastic. And being able to work from all those positions makes it easier to endure treatment. Because I wasn't just a passenger along for some crazy roller coaster ride, I was actually able to continue participating in my own life in much the same way that I was before. At this early time, the working title of our game was literally fuckcancer.gmx. <laughs> this only changed about four months into development when my prognosis improved due to the response my cancer had to chemotherapy. And the work was definitely therapy, uh, therapy for us. I know a lot of people say that making games is hard, and I had originally wanted to get up here and say, yeah, well, making games while you're dying is really fucking hard. <laughs> but the truth is that making games while going through treatment made treatment easier, and weirdly, going through cancer treatment made making games easier. It allowed me to focus in a way that I hadn't thought I'd be able to before. Work also became therapy for my brother. It was his way of helping in an otherwise helpless situation. And it was my way of keeping that creeping doom at bay. Every day I'd wake up with a list of important things to do, and Seth would be right there to assist. He'd take time in his evenings or when I was conked out from pain or drugs or both to add more things to the game to get me excited to get up again. A great example of this happened when I was interned in the hospital for a particularly poisonous drug called methotrexate. Seth asked if he should come by to visit, and I told him, no, you get that planting logic done because I want to build a fucking garden in my bed tonight. <laughs> he laughed and cranked on the project from home, and a few hours later, a new build arrived in Dropbox. I was able to plant a garden from my hospital bed. The name of the game eventually graduated to Four Corners. And the reason was that Seth was having a hell of a time figuring out how to generate an infinite world that didn't take up so much memory that it crashed everything that it was put on. Keep in mind that all of our experience up to this point was on the mobile market, and that's what we were aiming for. So we needed low RAM overhead. With Seth's best world-building algorithm, the game took seven minutes to generate and four minutes to walk across. I remember feeling really glum about this because it suddenly forced us to scale down the vision for the game. And then Seth suddenly said, Fuck this, if Minecraft can do it, so can we! <laughs> and he did a bunch of Googling. And he found, about, found out about this thing called Perlin Noise, which for those of you, I see a lot of heads nodding, for those of you who build procedurally generated worlds, that's the way to do it without taking up too much memory. Give it a Googling, figure it out. With these limitations removed, we suddenly had to abolish the name of the game. Four Corners no longer existed. We essentially had a bunch of different infinities to work with. We figured we'd be done with the game in about two months. Now, this was back in February of 2014, about four months into treatment and dev on the game. We decided to call it Crashlands. GDC of 2014 rolled around a week after my fifth chemotherapy session. With a severely damaged immune system and an intense dragging sense of fatigue, I boarded a plane along with Seth to come here and see if we couldn't wrangle up some press for our new title. We'd already worked twice as long on this thing as anything we'd previously built, and we were really excited to see what the critics thought. And basically, everyone we met with was completely unimpressed. <laughs> and this is something to keep in mind. I mean, the, the masters at Pixar talk, talk about this with how every movie they make starts out as complete and utter garbage. And uh, I think a lot of games work the same way. At least Crashlands certainly fit the pattern. We returned from GDC a little down, but inspired. We took time each week to jam out a new game in just eight hours. We needed a break from Crashlands like I needed a break from being poisoned, and luckily, at the end of March, I finally got that break because my sixth and final treatment finished. I rang the bell in the chemo ward, which signaled the end of treatment, celebrated for a day, and then we got back to work. My scan had come back, not totally clean, but the doctor said it was probably just healing in the affected areas from all the chemotherapy. They said it was probably nothing to worry about. Seth and I settled into the grind work of dev. We were in that process of, of the game development point where you know everything you need to make, you just got to put in a ridiculous amount of time to get it done. 
And then something funny happened. Once the clamor from GDC died down and the scan came back relatively okay, we realized we had a problem, which is that I wasn't going to die. Turns out being alive means you have a lot of work to do. Uh, <laughs> we had to turn this game, we'd, or this toy that we had really been making for the past six months into an actual full-fledged sellable title. Our trip to, DG, to GDC had really ripped the wool off our eyes regarding whether or not Crashlands was good. Uh, it was more of a boring toy with a few tiers of crafting equipment shoved in. I still had a scan coming up in June, but I was feeling great, had no obvious lumps, and the doctors were pretty confident that I was in the clear. So we just decided to look forward and start building for the future. June rolled around, and I went in for my scan. We waited patiently for the results, and finally they came through. The doctors found something. The constellation of nodes under my left arm where all the mess started were glowing again. The doc told me I had cancer and needed to prepare for salvage chemotherapy, which is as bad as it sounds, plus not one but two stem cell transplants. These were designed to simultaneously nuke my cancer into orbit and then lock it out by giving me someone else's blood and immune system permanently. My world exploded. I really felt like I had mined the first cancer experience for all sorts of wisdom, and I wasn't even mad about it. I felt like I had gained so much from facing my own mortality, but to have to do it again and have it somehow be worse, it's just like, what the fuck was this? My girlfriend and I left the hospital numb. We went to a nearby park where I made her a ring out of clover, and we laid in the grass. It talked about the future that we were not going to have. My parents, who both work in medicine, clamored for a biopsy before we called the case closed and I was interned again. The doctors gave us some pushback, but eventually yielded and decided to take a huge needle, stab it into my chest, and bite out pieces of where they thought the tumors were. We waited a tense few days for what were going to be the legitimate results to this whole thing, during which time I asked my girlfriend to marry me, and she became my fiance. A day or so later, the doctor called. She told me I didn't have cancer. Great. Three of the five biopsy reports had come back from pathology, and they said it was all fine. We rejoiced and began carrying on with our lives, feeling sufficiently yo-yoed by the whole thing. But before we could make it to lunch, the doctor called back. Those remaining two biopsy reports had been given to a different team, and they sent her a note about the abnormality they found in the cells. She told me I had cancer again, and I needed to pack my bags and head for salvage chemotherapy the next day. The next morning... I woke up with my bags packed. On the way out the door, received another call from the doctor. She had investigated the genetics team's claims and found the cells weren't cancerous. They were just abnormal, and again, what looked like consistent patterns based on healing from chemotherapy. Turns out I didn't have cancer. But I did get a fiancé out of the deal, so <laughs> after taking a long and furious nap... Uh, we decided to fix our focus on just getting this goddamn game done so we could close the chapter on this whole cancerous escapade. And luckily, help was on the way. Our third brother and final co-founder of the studio, Adam, had been trapped in Texas getting a PhD in molecular biology. Once I got sick, he made the call to wrap up his PhD as quickly as physically possible and join us in the studio. Seth, myself, and the rest of our family flew down to Texas, watched him give us a defense, and not more than 20 minutes after being minted as a card-carrying PhD, we gave him his butterscotch business cards and stole him away from academia. <laughs> Adam's fresh eyes let us re-examine a lot of the systems that we had built in Crashlands. We were trying to build toward a feeling rather than from a mechanic, and this was a method of dev that we weren't familiar with up to this point. The feelings we were trying to hit were simply exploration and joy. Anything that got in the way of those two things, we ripped out or nullified as best as, as, best as we possibly could, but one thing had been giving us a huge amount of trouble. And that was inventory. Crashlands was shaping up to be an enormous crafting game with over 400 components that built into 540 different recipes. That naturally meant that players had to spend a lot of time collecting resources and managing them. And it also meant that players' exploration hunts were always cut short by a lack of bag space. Seth and I both hated this, but the best we'd managed to do so far was to keep adding slots to the player's bag. By the time Adam came around, the player had 80 inventory slots. Adam played the game and simply asked a question that neither Seth nor I had had the presence of mind to pose. 
What if we just didn't have an inventory? This question really had echoes of those same questions I asked about life when I first got diagnosed. Something as basic to a crafting game, as traditionally minded and glossed over as having an inventory, was up for negotiation. Did we actually need this? Was this a tool that was helping and serving our players, or was it merely something we were doing because that's what people do? Removing the inventory did seem mildly insane, but on closer inspection, we found a truth. The only way to get rid of the friction between exploration and crafting was to literally destroy the concept of a limited inventory. We decided to make the inventory infinite and completely non-searchable, meaning players couldn't open up a bag to see all the stuff they had. Instead, the total number of items that a player had would show up when they needed to, like when they're about to craft a recipe. This ended up being a huge design win for Crashlands. It freed up tons of player attention for the game world and put the focus back on exploration rather than sack management. In other words, it gave us and our players more clarity. Adam brought some other firepower to the bear for the studio. Seth and I had been so focused first on the studio surviving and then on me surviving that we never had the bandwidth to step back and ask, ask how we could better operate as an entity. We were trapped in this vicious cycle of just making games without ever spending the time necessary to build the infrastructure to help ourselves. So things like email lists, marketing tools, art pipelines, command build line tools, we just didn't have the time to investigate. I mean, I was dying and the studio basically had no money. Adam's arrival signaled a big shift, though, because since he wasn't trapped on the game side of things, he started thinking about how we could improve our odds of success in the long term. Game over game. Through a bunch of discussions, we realized that our biggest hang-up in growing a studio and securing ourselves for the future was one of player retention between games. Because at this point, though we had accumulated three million players between all of our other free titles, we had no way to communicate with them. That meant that, it w that with every title we launched, we had to effectively start from zero again and beg, borrow, and steal to get on the front page of the App Store and simply recollect our fans. That's an exhausting and non-optimal long-term strategy. So our solution was to build our own proprietary login system called Bscotch ID. With basically no knowledge in web programming, Adam pulled a Tony Stark in a cave and somehow pounded the first version together in the span of a few weeks. It was basically an email capture system with a bunch of other features, chief among them our own cloud saving system. And this would allow people to move their saves between PC and mobile, something we refer to as a save bridge. So you could play on something like Steam, pick up your device, take it on the road with you, and play your same save. The advent of Bscotch ID and My Good Health had us thinking really far downrange because we were finally building for the future, and it felt great. We saw what Crash Games was shaping into and decided it was possible for us to launch not just on the mobile storefronts, but also on Steam. And with the save bridge in place, we could launch simultaneously across all three and cause as much ruckus as possible, given that we had no money for marketing. It was the end of 2014 by this time, and the game was still very much in process, despite all of our hopeful pushing otherwise. It turns out that Crashlands wasn't actually anywhere near done. And it turns out that my cancer wasn't anywhere near done either. In December of 2014, I was showering and felt a lump on the side of my chest. Salvage chemotherapy began a few weeks into 2015. I was placed in the hospital for three days every 21 days and given a more intense blast of chemo than before. And all the while, we kept plodding away on Crashlands, adding more and more assets and expanding the game world. I admit that this phase of the cancer is extremely difficult to talk about. I was in a dark place. My focus on process, one of the gifts from the previous bout with cancer, was about the only thing getting me through. I simply focused on the very next asset for the game, the next couple minutes I had with my fiance or the next episode of Parks and Recreation. My feeling of having a future was basically obliterated. The chemotherapy was so harsh this time around that I would throw up every few hours in the hospital and be unable to walk up a flight of stairs without becoming exhausted for weeks once I left. Further, the treatments were starting to affect other parts of my body, which meant we started facing several delays due to complications. Hope was in short supply. And at the same time, Crashlands was also experiencing its own bout of darkness. While the game had shaped into a wonderful crafting RPG, it dawned on us that the game had no differentiation points whatsoever from other crafting games, aside from the infinite inventory concept. And that, to us, didn't sound like something we could sell. The game would, if left unchanged, look like every other crafting game on the market. It didn't have a unique hook, despite the level of innovation we had brought to the design. 
And this brought us to a discerning point that we now keep in mind as we build our games forward. Differentiation within a genre is simply not nearly as good as separating yourself from existing genres. Present players are not interested in improvements. They want whatever is new. And Crashlands, for all of its innovations, was very much focused on the small stuff. It was pretty far in the weeds of the crafting genre as far as where all the innovations lied. So we needed to get out of the weeds and move a mountain. We needed to alter the landscape we were in so we could, so we could pitch the game as effectively different from other titles like Terraria and Don't Starve. Otherwise, we weren't going to be selling much of anything. The future looked bleak because the project meant to pull us through the destruction of cancer felt like it was going nowhere and the cancer wasn't going the fuck away like it was supposed to. So we started asking questions. What can we do to make this game stand out from other crafting titles? What could we do that would also add a sense of exploration to the world? The answer fell out of one of our brainstorming sessions like an anvil. We could use a story. There weren't any crafting games with long-form, hilarious narratives, at least none that we could think of. Most didn't have much to say beyond throwing players into the woods and making them punch trees to survive. Seth plugged a hard-coded quest into the game to see how it felt, and it felt really good. So Adam got to work building a back-end tool that would let us make these stories, and we were suddenly back onto something. And not a second too late, because GDC 2015 was right around the corner. It was just a few days after my second of three rounds of salvage therapy. The doctors warned me that I'd be attending the conference at the low point of my entire immune system. They told me not to go, in fact. So I told them to find me a doctor buddy in San Francisco who could save me from a fatal neutropenic fever if that happened to happen. I agreed to wear a mask on the plane, and that was that. We showed the game to our press contacts at Touch Arcade, to a few of our contacts at the app stores, and a few other media sites, and I tried desperately not to touch my hair because it started falling out. Our contacts were excited. The game looked like a hilarious, weird adventure by this point, so press started to roll in and built a little tiny hype fire around us. We returned from GDC buoyed and feeling like we had done the right thing, so we dug back into the work. Shortly after, my eyebrows fell out. We carried on slamming content into the game as fast as we physically could. We had, for some arbitrary reason, decided the game needed three biomes worth of content. Each one ended up taking six enemies, 20 resources, about 80 components, as well as six tiers of armor, each of which had a helm, gloves, chests, and pants. And then there were all the weapons, the gadgets, the trinkets, and the furniture. This is one big game, so word of the wise, crafting games require a shitload of content. Had I actually died that year, the game would never have gotten done. As we ran up to May of 2015, my first stem cells transplant loomed. The doctors warned me that it would be incredibly painful. The chemotherapy regimen a patient receives for this sort of transplant I was getting is, ominously enough, called BEAM. Adam and Seth were nervous that they'd be trapped away from me from the duration of my time in the hospital. This is because I could have a minimum of visitors. Anytime someone came to, came to see me, it would risk me dying from picking up some plague vector they were carrying while I had no immune system. So they decided to stay out, and they just kept building chunks of crash lands while my chemo dripped away. And the chemo goes in slow, for six hours a day, and it has a lagged effect. I was actually so nervous about how the treatment would go this time around that the only thing I could do was escape. And escape I did. While the nausea rolled in, I picked up Dragon Age Inquisition. On the sixth and final day of chemotherapy, I actually beat the game. As a spoiler alert, you kill a dragon in the end. <laughs> Something about the symbolism perked up my spirits as I headed into that second week, and it's a good fucking thing it did, because I don't think I understood what sickness was until the second week of that transplant. I got a 103 degree fever that lasted for four days. During that time, I was vomiting every 45 minutes or so, crapping out my insides and coughing away like a broken leaf blower. At one point, I had to stand for 60 seconds for a chest x-ray. I nearly passed out and then vomited. Adam and Seth continued working on the game but couldn't handle the extreme stress from the hospital stay. They'd simply be getting drip-fed texts from my fiancé or my mom, which read, Fever at 104 and not breaking. He's coughing so hard he's vomiting. They dove into the work to escape, but Crashlands was now too sensitive. It was our project, and I was very much out of the picture. 
And they built a small puzzle game, kind of like threes. And so it's my phone, so I had something completely non-taxing to take my mind off of. I played that game while I was cramped over the hospital toilet for so long that my legs went numb. I was running on fumes and transfusions at this point for more than two weeks. I watched some movies during this time, but I don't remember any of them. I don't remember an entire week of this whole experience. I truly feel that I was pushed through the veil of life to the other side when my doctor just held onto my pinky toe and then dragged me back across. I did recover after a time, but the depth of that suffering sat with me for a very long time. I got out of the hospital a month after being interned, and I was restless, vaguely traumatized, and really ready to build some shit. The three of us brothers sat down and specked out what we had left to finish the game. Adam had completed the back-end systems for story creation, and most of the in-game content was ready, so now we really just needed the story. But we also needed to go about getting on Steam Greenlight. We did a bunch of research on Greenlight's process and realized that we need at least six weeks of lead time to make sure that we were in the clear. After looking at the games available on there and seeing what their pitfalls and successes were, we decided the majority of the focus should be on the trailer. We banged out a script for a ridiculous voiceover trailer inspired by Battle Block Theater. We finished the trailer and launched our green light campaign on June 19th of 2015. 42 hours later, bright and early on Monday morning, we were through. And we just had to finish the game. Work on the story began in earnest. Great writers suggest that you write stories from what you know. So keeping that in mind, we decided we'd write the story of someone just trying to do their job while the whole world fucked with them. Because we knew a whole lot about that by this point in time. I dove back into the hospital in August of 2014 for another four-week stay, this time to receive the donor immune system that would, in theory, keep my cancer at bay for the rest of my life. This one was shockingly easy. Aside from one allergic response, those four weeks breezed by. Rather than disappear into work, I flung myself again into a game, Skyrim. In adventuring across the world that Bethesda built, I was reinvigorated to complete Crashlands, and I also killed a shitload of dragons. <laughs> this is our goal, to create a place that people could escape into, full of joy and exploration. And it was now about time to pay it all forward. With my hospital stays completed, we had nothing but open road in front of us. We still didn't know if I had cancer or not, but we knew that we had done literally everything medically known possible to help by this point. We finished the story, the content for the game, and got the marketing engine spun up, which largely consisted of a spreadsheet with lots and lots of email addresses in it. For those of you marketing your own project, there's a phenomenal 45-minute video from Total Biscuit about how to approach press and YouTubers. The big lesson is to make it easy for them to participate in the way you want that's mutually beneficial. Here's what our email to press ended up looking like. You'll notice that the embargo date is very small at the bottom. We'll come back to this error later on. Another tool I suggest, since you should value your time as much as a dying person does, is Mail Merge for Google Sheets. It's cheap, it's like 30 bucks. And it lets you send 1,500 emails per day in a highly automated fashion. Plus, it has great open tracking, so you can actually A-B test your own press emails. So as our press engine got rolling, we started talking about beta testing. Having nearly died a few times, you can imagine that I was quite impatient to get this fucking game out the door. I was firmly in the camp of, get it out, by the end of 2015. And the main reason, honestly, is because I was terrified. My first cancer scan since, since receiving the stem cell treatments was scheduled for December 6th of 2015. That'd be the first one in the whole year of treatment and the relapse. And I didn't want to have anything getting in the way of getting the game out. My brother Adam, ever the scientist, talked me down from the ledge. He created a beta testing tool to let players report bugs from within the game. Each feedback item also uploaded the player's save. So if we were confused about what was happening, we could simply pull it down, walk through it on our own device, and discover for ourselves. We recruited 170 people who were in that Bscotch ID system we built, and they tested the game for us. Now, since I had played through it in its entirety while I was building the story, I figured we'd find maybe a handful of bugs. However, the game had grown to over 40 hours of content by this point, so imagine my surprise when our testers found over 2,000 bugs in one month. And more than bulletproofing the game, they came up against problems that challenged some of our original design pillars of exploration. So we made several sweeping changes to the game's content and systems alongside crushing all the bugs, 
but there was one that we left out. Players really wanted a quest tracker. And in Crashlands, we chosen to give all the quests to players in the form of actual written dialogue that they had to read. Their quest log, instead of having a list of tasks, had a list of conversations, arrayed as though through text message that they could read for clues. In the same breath of feedback, players would applaud the story and their connection to the wily characters that we had built, and then request a punch list of tasks to complete, not realizing that if we provided a punch list, that, they would, that the narrative would have fallen to the wayside. So it turns out if you want players to read your content, you can just make them do it. We certainly did. Without the beta testers, this game would have been absolute garbage. Now that beta had wrapped, we were looking at our calendar and sent notes to our platform contacts to see when a good launch window would be. It turned out the third week of January 2016 was going to be calm. So we began researching launch, date, launch dates for other titles to see what we could do. While we pondered our timing, I prepared for my scan. And on December 6th, 2015, I went to the hospital with my heart in my chest. I had never had a clean scan even when I'd been mistakenly declared cancer-free back in June of 2014. I called my grandfather. He's an Iowan farmer with a brutal work ethic who, months earlier, had fallen off of a cattle walk and broken six ribs, but decided to finish out six hours of hard manual labor before getting some ibuprofen. I told him I was nervous for the scan and about what the result would be. There was a pause on his end of the line, and then he said, no matter what happens, it won't change anything. I rolled back and forth in the PET scan machine and felt a calm clarity building. He was right. I'd been thriving under the thumb of cancer for the past two years. I'd arguably done my best work. I'd been my best for my fiancé and brothers. If the cancer was still there, I'd still be doing the same thing as if it wasn't, just with a few more interruptions. If I wasn't going to be dead, I wasn't going to be done. We went upstairs and waited in the doctor's office for what felt like an eternity for the oncologist to come by. And she entered the room smiling, but she's always smiling, so you can never tell. Without much fuss, she finally told us the news. There was nothing, nothing on the scan. The cancer was gone. The blood dragon, the real one that had plagued me for two years, was dead. We claimed January 21st as our launch date and suddenly had a fire under our asses to make sure that everything was ready to go. The lead up to launch felt very similar to getting that final scan because we had done everything we knew was possible under our own power and to the best of our ability over the past two years, and now we were simply waiting in an eerily calm manner for the market to tell us if we had done things correctly. No one guaranteed, guaranteed us anything on launch day. While we had strong confidence in several sites that would be covering the game on day one, we had no direct confirmation from any one of the more than 1,000 press and influencers we had e emailed. Further, the storefronts themselves will never tell you if you're going to get a feature, especially if you're in India. While we kept in contact with our people at Steam, iTunes, and Google Play, we genuinely did not know if we'd be getting featuring treatment on day one. And we desperately needed it because, again, we had no marketing dollars. This is a straight PR campaign we were running. So despite the insane level of uncertainty, the three of us were comfortable. We'd kind of learned to be so from the previous two years of nonsense. We were confident we'd, we, that we had done the best that we could, and so we resigned ourselves to, we resigned our fretting to the realm of uselessness and simply tried to relax instead. That is, until our press embargo was broken. So here's the email from earlier. Again, note that we put the press embargo date at the bottom of the box. A big YouTuber decided to play the game and loved it, so he made and scheduled some videos and didn't pay attention to the embargo date. His videos went live a full nine days before launch. The internet is a remarkably fickle place, and we thought that if the gates opened and all of our YouTubers launched their videos a week early, that by the time our actual launch rolled around, we'd be long forgotten. Timing was critical for this whole operation to work. And then angry emails started coming in. Other YouTubers who had read the embargo date were upset that we gave this person an exclusive. And they started threatening to pull coverage. And you have to understand why, which is that the first video that launches is almost guaranteed to lead in search results. Which naturally means that other YouTubers will be at a huge disadvantage when it comes to gaining views on a popular game. So we began strategizing for how to contain the damage coming out of this. The easiest way by far was simply to reach out to the YouTuber and ask him to pull the video down for a few days. We sent him an email and we met with an automated on-vacation message. 
He had scheduled three more videos over the next few days and hopped on an international flight. We, fr- we frantically reached out to him via Twitter and a couple other means, but could not get a hold of him. And a day passed, and a second video popped up. Now other smaller YouTubers who had planned coverage of the game started telling us that they would have to pull out. And this was heartening in at least one way, which was confirmation. Up until this point, we had no guarantees that anyone gave a shit about what we were doing. And now we suddenly had a crowd of people talking about their coverage for the game. They were furious, of course, but, but they were talking. We went back into strategy mode and examined our options. We couldn't trust that the YouTuber in question would be responding to any of our communications by the time his suite of videos came out. And that meant there was a guaranteed flow of Let's Play videos coming from one person, which meant that we were guaranteed to be generating ill will with the entire YouTuber community if we didn't put a stop to it. It seemed our only option was to lift the embargo, just for YouTubers, and explain what had happened. And this was non-ideal in every way, as we wanted players to be able to purchase the game the moment that they saw it. But we were cornered, since we'd want to work with all these YouTubers in the future. We emailed everyone and explained the situation and lifted the embargo. We have a saying in the studio, there's no such thing as a good launch. Something or everything will go wrong and threaten to derail all of your work. Luckily, our training and keeping a calm head and researching our options from the previous two years made it easier to figure out what to do. With the Let's Players unleashed, a small amount of hype around the game began to build. Several prominent YouTubers released videos with with, uh, view counts in the hundreds of thousands. We watched each one with a mix of excitement and terror. Then we found that these people were having a genuinely good time with the game. Relief kind of started to settle in. We knew if nothing else happened, we at least made something that was good. Launch day loomed. We gathered whiskey, wine, and our spouses in my small apartment and prepared to launch the game on mobile on the evening of the 20th. And then an email came in from Steam. My heart sank in my chest, thinking we somehow missed something and we were going to get delayed. I quickly skimmed it and found out that the opposite had happened. Due to the hype surrounding the game and the preview coverage we'd gotten, Steam was taking a chance on us. They were going to give us a pop-up feature spot for the weekend. We could hardly believe it. We hit the button at 11 p.m. on January 20th, and Crashlands went live on mobile. And the next morning, Adam and Seth arrived at 7 a.m., and we launched on Steam. And then we waited. Crashlands received an incredible amount of featuring support from the storefronts. On Steam, that weekend pop-up kept our sales numbers high for four days. And on iTunes, we received the Editor's Choice Award for iPad, which is a full week of featuring Google Play gave us a little front page nod. All of these were due to us building relationships with the platform holders over the previous year. Simply an email here and there, showing press coverage, showing that we were still working on the game, and keeping them excited. We sold 131,000 units in 10 days between all three platforms. We made back 10 times our meager dev costs. More importantly, players loved the game, especially on mobile. We even stood as the highest rated mobile game of all time for a few weeks, and we remain toward the top to this day. Our reviews were glowing across the board, and though we didn't strike at the heart of the PC crowd as much as we'd like to, we still secured a solid review from PC Gamer, which is our first PC review. And then came the notes from players. People who knew nothing of the origins of this game wrote to us, telling us about how it was helping them get through life. One man, suffering from PTSD, found relief for the first time in months for 60 hours. Another, dealing with the death of a loved one, found comfort in the ridiculous stories we'd written. And yet another, who had just started chemotherapy and picked the game up on a whim, found his treatments forgotten. Crashlands, the game we made to escape our own reality, was now casting a spell on hundreds of thousands of players, and it worked, and it mattered. To date, Crashlands has sold 374,157 units across all three platforms. It's swollen the ranks of our Bscotch ID system to more than 350,000 people, meaning our next game launch is likely to be even more powerful than this one. We were nominated for Best Mobile Game of the Year at DICE just last week. We got a nod from Time Magazine, one of the top 10 games of 2016. And we won the much-coveted Touch Arcade Game of the Year Award for Mobile. With the revenue from Crashlands, we've even managed to expand our studio, so it's no longer just the three of us brothers struggling to get by. With the addition of our four hires, Andy, Tifa, Sher, and Monique, we've begun an expedition into creating meaning in a whole other way, 
through creating a studio and a vibrant work culture. When my brothers and I spoke about Crashlands before launch, we all agreed on what it meant to us. This game, the story, and the work on it all represent the biggest monument of hope and retaliation that we could craft. It's the single biggest fuck you to cancer that we could deliver. Making games and meaning out of life is hard. If you take a designer's eye to the work you do and the way you live, you'll come to find that the unimportant, falsely urgent activities that take up much of your time will begin to fall away. If you focus on your processes rather than your goals, if you stay grounded in the world around you and control what you can, if you rely on those around you, and if you approach work as the daily act of making meaning in your life, the way you live and the games you produce will naturally get better. Most importantly, you'll get to create the experiences that give other people meaning when their world doesn't seem to have any. So when the press ignore your emails, when your launch fails or your family forgets your birthday, or when your doctor tells you you might not be around for another year, and when you experience setback after setback as you try to make something meaningful out of your work, just keep in mind this basic fact of life in Cape Dev. If you're not dead, you're not done. Thank you. Got any questions? I'm an open book. Yeah, of course. I hope it's worthwhile. If you got any questions, feel free to snag the mic. If you got personal stuff you don't want to talk about, you can just shoot me an email. It's always good too. My voice is cracking all over the place. And if you have any specific questions about, you know, mobile and cross platform game dev stuff, we know a lot of technical things too, besides all of our story nonsense. So Hello. Hello, hello. Uh, Look up 88 Games. I've got a question about launching on mobile and Steam at nearly the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, I've kind of been my experience that mobile games, if you're coming from Steam, that's a good thing. If you're going from mobile oh, yeah. to Steam, you sort of maybe looked down on a bit. Correct. Uh, how was your experience doing it at the same time and uh, any lessons learned there? Yeah, so I think... Uh so we, I, I, this is honestly one of the things we did not, I think, control very well with our marketing message regarding the game. Um, our goal as a studio is to build cross-platform games that essentially don't exist. They don't exist on any platform. They, they flex to play really well on any. And so they're not just like a shitty port. And the, the problem is if you're going from mobile to PC, as you said, there's just this general idea that if you're on mobile, then the game is terrible. And we did have that happen. Actually, um, it was noted in our, in our PC Gamer review that the the controls seem simple, or the game seemed kind of simple. And the interesting thing about it is we, we actually employed a, a control scheme changes. We added controller support a few months later. Our reviewer came by at PAX and played the game with a controller. And he said, wow, this seems way more complex. <laughs> we said, yeah, we split one interaction into 14 different buttons. Like, it was all there before, you know? Um, so there's, there's a lot of that messaging that I think is hard, honestly very hard to control. There is a, there is a natural bias there. Um, I honestly think for us it's going to be going to be a matter of sort of controlling that up front. Crash Runs was originally talked about first as a mobile game, and then we added PC on later. So I think like we were kind of, we kind of shot ourselves in the foot in a couple of ways with that um, because our marketing messaging was never really controlled because we didn't know what we were doing. So I think approaching that from the angle of saying like this is a cross-platform title as opposed to saying a mobile title or a PC title, should help a lot with alleviating some of that stuff in the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello. Um, so I was incredibly impressed with your the Butterscotch ID um, with kind of trying to create a 
sustained player base or mm -hmm. communication system between yes. multiple games. Um, I was just curious if you could talk about that a little bit more, like what the inspiration was for that, and as with how you came from it from free mobile games leading into sure. Crashlands. Yeah, so, so the question is basically, uh, you know, the inception of Bscotch ID is our back-end proprietary login system and uh, what, what we're trying to hope to do with it, I think, in the future. So what we saw from our, we launched four games, uh, two of them right before we started working on Crashlands and two we actually launched during. Two of those eight-hour games that we made, um, we spun out into slightly larger projects, the first of which had basically our first experiment with Bscotch ID in it. And uh, what we found is that we used, we wanted to use it to roll, it's like everyone's played Katamari Damachi, right? Like roll the ball forward, make it bigger and bigger. This is basically the problem we had is we were looking at our game dev stuff and we're like, all right, we have three million players, but we can't, we can't just roll them forward into our next title. And so the idea was that if we could just get an email and then provide a suite of uh, other services to players that sort of sweeten the pot to keep them active in there. So there's actually friends, there's a friend system um, there's a perk system, so if you, if you achieve something in uh, Crashlands, like you beat a specific boss, it'll actually unlock content in one of our other games, if you're logged in. So it starts doing this sort of cross-promotion of the games themselves, and then we, we use this, uh, we sort of watch players' activity, and we can send them specific messages regarding certain games that they're, that they're likely to play based on what we've seen from other user statistics in the past. So we actually, we don't use Flurry. We don't use any of those things. We found them generally, analytics to generally be overwhelming and not useful data um, almost across the board. And with this sort of stuff, we've slowly started piecing this in together so that our whole portfolio is back and forth supported. So when we launch the next game, we'll send an email to 350,000 people, which we've estimated is going to be about 50,000 people on launch day who will open the email and see it. We don't know what the buying rate is yet, but we'll be able to talk about that hopefully in like six months. Um, and then from there, you know, if they get into the game, if they're a new person getting into the game, we're going to put perks in the next title that we launch that retroactively go into Crashlands, that go into our previous four titles. So you'll basically fall into our portfolio. And a big inspiration for it was actually Blizzard with Battle.net. Um, a lot of the cross-game stuff that they do and all this other, they're sort of fully independent. And our goal is to be a fully independent studio and sort of reverse a lot of the needs that we have for being completely reliant on the platforms. Like, we love all three of our platforms, of course, but it's really terrifying, given how many games are coming out nowadays, to know that with very few marketing dollars, that if you don't get a feature spot with a premium game, that you're kind of doomed. So we wanted to kind of take some control back into our realm for that. So as a quick follow-up to question to that, if you don't mind. Um, is the plan then to, as you go on releasing new titles, to continue doing even just small updates to pre like your existing library. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So things like adding, you know, adding a few new achievements and that sort of thing mm. doesn't take very long for us. Um, we actually built in there's a bunch of hidden ones that people have already unlocked that point to the other games that just don't do anything right now. So we'll just go back in and update them and people will get new ships in like a previous game based on some of their activity there. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll keep on updating stuff and then eventually at some point if it's like, you know, five years down the road and we got 12 games or something crazy going on, then we won't worry about some of the older titles, but Cool. Anybody else? Hey, uh, you mentioned using storytelling to differentiate uh, from other crafting games, and I was just curious how you and your brothers collaborated on the writing. You know, if one person was kind yeah. of in charge, or if you you kind of shared that responsibility. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so everything we do is so we have just an extremely collaborative work environment, I guess, and so. Um, it was basically the case we all, we all huddled for like three days and came up with the major beats of the story. So like a lot of the really good advice I've seen is if you have a beginning and an end, then you can just fill it in. So we kind of figured out what exactly that was and figured out what the theme was, which was essentially this, in the case of uh, Crashlands, it's a delivery driver who's just trying to essentially ship their fucking packages. And like they get stolen from you in the beginning, your ship crashes, and then you have to go through and you essentially... Uh, solve a world domination plot that an alien has, unrelated. You're just trying to ship your goddamn packages. And so, and so we thought this was a hilarious thing. Like, we wanted to subvert the usual sort of, you're the only one. Like, no, nah, you're like a UPS driver. It's fine. Um, so we, we actually started, we basically started out with that, front and back side of it. And then uh, Adam finished building this back end tool. So it's, it's almost like story programming. Uh, it's called the creator. It's a little thing we built in the back end. And so you can go in there and you can trigger, you trigger events, you can trigger changes in the world based on players completing quest objectives. And so uh, I basically went in and just laid down, I, don't know, I think it took about three months to write the whole thing. 
Uh, it's about 50,000 words, a basic book, um, 56,000 words. And I would lay down sort of the broad strokes, just go through and power through the whole thing. And then Adam would come back in and clean up stuff and add funny jokes and things. And I think one of my favorite things, actually, like the creator lets you do all sorts of crazy shit. But my favorite one is there's this one story uh, involving a, a tendrom, which is like a furry goat person. And they have, they're trying to hide from the villain in the game. And when you walk up to them, you find out that like, they're hiding in a plant. And then they, like, as, the, as the quest trigger shifts, then they appear. So it, look, it looks like they're transforming from a plant into a creature, when in reality we're just swapping these assets out. And so like, having a few different people tackle this thing actually showed, like, I didn't realize we could do that with the engine, essentially. So having a bunch of these sort of collaboration points was fantastic for getting all the work done. So essentially we do, we sometimes refer to it in farming terminology as plow, seed, uh, water. So one person comes in, does like 90% of the work. Next person comes in, finishes and polishes stuff up. And then someone comes in and looks at it. It's like a tweaking some stuff here and there. Thank you. Hmm? Cool. Well, if that'll be all, I think you guys are free to go. Thanks so much. <laughs>